So what do you think is the craziest thing that happened while you guys were out on the walleye tour? Oh, that's an easy one. When we were at Fresno, in the tournament, you're allowed to use two rods. So okay. I casted this guy out. I set it down right here. And I grabbed another rod. And I'm starting to fish with that rod. And I hear this rod starting to be pulled out of the back <laughs> of the boat. And I look over to see this rod just disappearing in the water. Excellent. <laughs> A fish just took my rod. There might have been just some cussing in there, and yeah. I had no idea what happened. There I believe that. There was yeah. a lot of cussing. No one else saw what happened. My rod went under. It was a slip bobber. I'm like, the, I'm using the other rod that I have in my hand to try to like hook it and bring it back in. Well, it's gone. It like, I'm like, we're never getting this thing back. Um, yeah. And we're pretty disappointed because you're tournament fishing. Right. Right? And a fish to be able to pull the rod out is probably going to be able to measure, yeah. right? Yeah, and you're now one short. You're a shorter rod, so Short that's rod. like, yeah, so that's like screwing you as well, big yeah. time. Yeah, so I'm like telling everyone what just happened, and I look over, and I see this bobber pop up to the surface. <laughs> oh, oh. Where's just the popped bobber? Up. Right there. Oh, here, let's go get it. We're hustling to get over to where the bobber pops up to the surface. You got like a lobster buoy going now yep. where you're like, it's there, I know where it is now. As soon as we get over there, it goes back down again. Fish swimming around with my rod and the slip bobber. And finally we get over to the bobber, Chet gets it in the net and I start pulling it in and I can feel there's a fish on the end of it. Grab the line, grab the line, there you go. Oh, it's a big one, Chet. Okay. Get net, 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 okay, net. Okay, okay. And I end up hand lining in a 20 and a half inch walleye. Oh my gosh. <laughs> What the hell happened? <laughs> At that point in the tournament, it was our biggest fish. Nice. And for this lake, a very nice fish. Yeah, like nice. a 20 inch fish is like one that, you know, you want. If you can get five of those during this tournament, we're sitting really pretty. Dude, you got like, that's like an old man in the sea style yeah. way of fishing. Yeah. Hand lining in your, your big giant fish. Yeah, it was a crazy story. That's amazing actually, that's pretty sweet. Well, I have never, actually cooked a Montana walleye. I've cooked plenty of walleye before, but I've never had any from here, so. But I have an idea that I think you guys will really enjoy. Sweet, awesome. looking forward to it. All right, fellas. Beautiful day outside. It is. Gorgeous. Appreciate you letting us uh, cook up some fish with you here, so. Yeah, no problem. So the dish that I have in mind for you guys, like most of the time in meat eater cooks, we really kind of like, take it to a crazy direction, but you don't always need to reinvent the wheel. Sometimes you just need to ask yourself what makes the wheel special. And so we're making fried fish. We're Because honestly, it's one of the best things to do with walleye. It's a really good fish for frying. But I do think there's a couple ways that we can make it a little bit nicer. And so I want to show you guys a, a slightly different spin on, I don't know, a classic that everybody knows. Right, that sounds great, man. You know what today is? It's Friday. Friday. Fri Friday fish fry. <laughs> exactly. where, where I come from in Wisconsin, it's like a tradition. Yeah, exactly. Every Friday, Catholics have these fish fries, so it's fitting. It works out perfect. Well, speaking of, so to get started, obviously we need some, some fish fillets here. So what I'm thinking is, uh, you know, a standard fillet, but skin off as well. Okay. Cause this is gonna come out a little bit better that way. So do you have a, a preferred technique that you like to use? I mean, I, I really wouldn't call it, I mean, sure it's a technique, but it's kind of the way I did it growing up. Yeah, uh, well, why don't you show me how you do it? So I'm gonna start with this one. Okay. And it's, you know, not gutted, right? And there's a lot of meat up on the back by the head. So you want to come underneath the fins here and not just cut straight across, but kind of angle it back right. up towards the head. And you can kind of just take your knife and go at an angle like that. And, you know, then just take your knife and work it right along the, you can feel it, right. those bones going along the spine there. You want to keep it pressed down as much as you can so you're not missing any of that meat. And then you, and that wasn't the best job because there's still some there. But I like to keep this little tag on so it's easier to skin it here. And you just go. Oh, so you skin it without even like pulling it off. You just leave it in place. Right. That's pretty smart. It's the same way I grew up doing it too, just keeping it attached. Yeah. And then we can clean, you know, these bones yep. up, this, these ribs later. But there's one. Today's recipe is actually inspired by a method that's used in Japan. And it's called, uh, well, 
the term that you usually see is EB fry, but EB actually specifically means shrimp. But what's important about it is that it's a method where you're frying in a coating of flour and eggs and then a type of breadcrumbs called panko, which are not like our breadcrumbs that we have here in the United States. They're not toasted bread. They're actually like bread that's effectively been dehydrated. And gotcha. so that's why they're so white. And it's also why they're so crispy. And so the panko breading allows you to fry at a little bit higher temperature. So you get a much, much crunchier end product. But what's great about this for something like this with little small fillets, I'd be afraid if we put this in cornmeal or even in a batter, that by the time we fried it, it would just be annihilated. Like yeah. it would just be hammered. What'll be really great about this is that that panko is gonna be almost like a bulletproof vest. It's gonna create an armor for these fillets. So they're actually, the fillet itself isn't cooking from the oil. The fillet is steaming inside this encapsulation oh, okay. of the crunchy bread. And so it's gonna be a lot more moist and it should come out a lot less kind of beat up from the fryer. Yep. And then also simultaneously, we're gonna get a crunchier texture than you can ever get frying a little thin fillet. If we were cornmeal breading this, they'd cook so fast that we'd we wouldn't really have much crunch. Yep. We should get a really, really nice crunch using this method. So Chet, how many fish do you keep in your freezer at a time? Well, I, I actually keep a decent amount, but I need to reveal something to you guys. Okay. Which you already know this. Yep. I cannot eat freshwater white flaky fish. And it's, it's, it's <laughs> like, it's so ironic because it's like the love of my life. I get in trouble for fishing all the time. And it just saddens me to say I'm not going to be able to eat this beautiful dish, Kevin. So, so, all right, let me make sure I understand this. So, you can butcher this for us and hear us. Oh, right. I didn't even acknowledge that you have gloves on. Like, yep. so you can't eat this. And I can't really experiment too much with <laughs> yeah, that allergy. That's fair. But uh, it's it's insane. Chet's the uh, best fishing partner you could ever ask for because he doesn't want to keep any of the he fish. He can't keep any of the fish. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. But the reason why, to answer your question, how many fish, I have fish in the freezer because I like to give it away as gifts. Ah, okay, okay. So. That's awfully nice. That's of kind of funny. Well, yeah, you're not going to be able to taste this. Cool. So these are in the bag now. These are good to go. We're just going to let these sit for a second here. So um, how long do you like to let those sit? Just like a few minutes, okay. like th five minutes at most, basically. All right, I have some dishes set for you guys over here. If you wouldn't mind, let's set these up on the cutting board here. So flour, empty container, breadcrumbs. This is gonna be our order of operations here. This is it's what's called a three-stage breading, meaning literally it goes into three different processes here. We need to mix up the one in the middle, and this is the egg wash for this. So the way it works is the wet fillets need, obviously, something will stick to them. And so we start by going into flour to dry the outside, basically. Okay. Then we go into egg, which wouldn't stick to the wet filet without the flour. And then we go into breadcrumb. And this is all, all of our texture is happening here. This doesn't really do anything other than create sort of that barrier so that that steam takes place. Now, a lot of the times you'll see recipes and it's just plain eggs. And if that's the case, they don't really contribute anything to the flavor either. But what I have found is that I really like a mix of eggs and kind of a strange ingredient, especially if we're doing something Japanese, but plain yellow like hot dog mustard. Right wow. into the egg wash. Into the egg wash. And this works with any kind of fish that you're breading. I do this with catfish all the time. That little bite and acidity from the, the mustard right. just kind of makes it taste better. You just get like a little bit more of a well-rounded flavor when you oh, do yeah. it. Oh yeah, I can, I can start it comes out really thinking good. about it and it sounds, mm, sounds It's gonna so be good. good, yeah, yeah. This is one of the tasting notes that you get, so. But you could do this, honestly, like we, we do this if we're doing, this same sort of breading works for oysters, it works for shrimp. Honestly, they'll do pork cutlets the same way and so we'll use that mustard component in it every sure. time, so. so like gonna, for a, uh, like a pork schnitzel sandwich. Exactly, yeah. Now you're talking, now we got you back in the world of yeah. Midwestern food. Yeah. <laughs> right, I'm gonna have to try this out with pork. Yeah, deep fried pork sandwich. So I'm just gonna crack a few eggs in here so that we have plenty of egg wash for all of our fish. So, just kind of break up our eggs here. Take some of our mustard, not a ton. I mean, I have more here than I need. And just start kind of whisking it into this and mixing it up. 
Now you can go pure like straight eggs, which a lot of folks do, but I think it works a little bit better if you just add a little bit of milk to it or heavy cream or something like that. It doesn't need to be very much. So, since there's three of us here, my thought is like we can each own a step to this. Okay. Like this is gonna work. Team and one. then stash them on that. On yeah, the that'll be perfect okay. on that plate. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, man, a little teamwork. This is teamwork, baby. I'm looking forward to watching the show. I know it's gonna be a lot of fun. Maybe it will, uh, maybe even I will learn to be a decent fisherman after watching this. <laughs> Dude, it was a blast. Actually, we actually should take you fishing sometime. Out See, that's more like it. That's what I'm talking about. Yes. Nice, Seth. Good fish, buddy. Let's turn the fryer all the way up to its top temp, which should be 375 on these yep, sort of small 375. fryers. 375. Perfect. Now, while that comes up to temp, I want to show you guys how to make the sauce. Cool. Awesome. Great. All right, guys, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in here and kind of take the reins for a moment, if you don't mind. Uh, this will just be easier if I show you how to make it, walk you through it, as opposed to, you know. You'll probably be a little faster. I might be just this tiny bit faster yeah, than you guys. Faster. So taru taru sauce is tartar sauce, basically. And there's a lot of, like, theories as far as how did we end up with tartar sauce in Japan. Uh, and I don't know that anybody actually knows, like, the exact answer to that, but... What's cool about it is that it has some familiar kind of components. So if you've had tartar sauce before, which have you, you've had it, not I've had, had it. tartar okay. sauce. Okay, yeah. so then you'll know what it, it'll look very similar, but it also has some kind of uniquely Japanese ingredients that are pretty cool as well. And to me, I mean, if I'm being honest. Here, I can take that. Yeah, thank you, sir. I think that the, I think the Japanese tartar sauce is kind of the superior one to. They do it better. Yeah, I mean, they do a lot of things with just sort of more precision. And this is definitely one where they've, kind of thought out the flavor profile a little bit more, in my opinion, and you end up with something that's just a little bit tastier. So it just starts, one of the first kind of ingredients that's a little bit strange for it is that it really does rely on a fairly significant amount of raw onion. That brings some bite to it, and it also just brings a little bit of texture in the sense that it adds some crunch, you know? The next is pickles, and so we're using both sweet pickles and sour pickles. Now these are both gherkin pickles, so they're like little small cucumbers. So, Kevin, my family has a pickling business. So we actually have gherkins. Are these? Are these? Uh, what? Fa what's your brand? Forest Floor Foods. These are not your family's gherkins. No. <laughs> <laughs> Though, if I had known that, see, you're you're waiting to reveal too much information to me here, Chester. Like if you said, we need to hang make out sure, more. Make sure we use my family's pickles. I'd have said okay. If you'd said. Make sure you make something, anything, literally, other than fish. I would have said, you can't be on the episode. But but we still, we would have done something different, is what I'm saying. Chet, so. when you introduce yourself to people, you should be like, my name's Chester Floyd, I'm allergic to fish, and my family owns a pickling company. Yeah. Sour gherkins, which are called cornichons, which is what these are, and they're teeny, teeny, tiny. So obviously we can't dice those, we kind of just slice them up into small pieces. And these are all, I would say all these ingredients are fairly normal to a tartar sauce. Like it's not weird to have sweet and sour pickles in a tartar sauce. Now is when we start kind of taking a turn into the ingredients that are a little bit strange for the American, I guess, palate for it. And the first is that we're gonna use this right here, which is uh, dried mustard. So this is powdered mustard that has then been bloomed in water. And although it looks very much like regular yellow mustard, the intensity of this is way, way, way stronger. So really? yeah, if you've ever had like Chinese hot mustard, it's kind of like that. It's gonna yeah. be spicy. It doesn't have the same vinegary note to it. It's just So like the drying hot. of it just like makes it more concentrated? Well, no. So it actually, it's it's I'm not that- try it. Yeah, please. It's not that this has been dried. It's actually that unlike the rest of the mustard, it's mustard always starts dry it starts with mustard flour or ground mustard seeds but that's all this is is ground mustard seeds that have then been rehydrated in a little bit of water basically it's, it's very good yeah, it's, but it's intense it's got a yeah kick, it's got a bite to it's it it's intense yeah. it's delicious so that's our first one a little bit of white pepper is our next one and white pepper again just doesn't show up very much in american cookery have you guys tasted white pepper actually oh, yeah. don't do that so yeah. don't stick your finger in here it's, it's a lot stronger super intense yeah much much stronger than than black pepper yeah 
<coughs> the next one is gonna be. Yeah, are you good? I'm good. <laughs> I would give you something to wash it no, down with. Good. I don't have anything. It's so. great. All right, so the next one is sesame oil. So roasted, like dark sesame oil. And it's not very much, but you want some. You can't use it much because it's just so intense. Like you smell it, like the, the aroma of it is really, really, really strong. Then is this ingredient, which is um, lemon vinegar. So lemon juice that has been turned into vinegar as opposed to just fresh lemon juice. And we're gonna use both. This stuff is oh, amazing I can smell though. That. Yeah, yeah, it smells like, it's like lemonade. Like, yeah. Yeah. Not a very common ingredient. Not at all. It's actually kind of hard to find, but it makes a huge difference. And it's one of my favorite ingredients if you're doing anything with fish. Not just fried, it doesn't matter, like just fish in general, this is an ingredient that really sets it off. Fresh lemon juice, so we have the lemon vinegar and we're gonna have fresh lemon juice, both. And then hard cooked eggs, so hard boiled eggs, which is, again, gets a little bit weird here, but the Japanese tartar sauce uses both the, yo the yolks and the whites of a hard cooked egg. Now these are Can your- I peel this one? Too? Please do, yeah. These are your friend's eggs, so they're super fresh, which means they're gonna be kind of hard to peel, but that's okay. When we mix stuff up, they kind of just happen to break up. But leaving those chunks of egg in there is again, one of the marquees of this style of sauce. It's just the preference that, that they would have to be able to see all these sort of individualized ingredients. So I saved what I think are the two most interesting ingredients for the last year. So this is the first one, which is pickled wasabi stems. So when you eat wasabi, like in sushi, it's yeah. the root. It's the part that grows underground. This is the part that grows above it. So this is the green plant, the leaves, the stems, stuff like that. And it has almost a caper-like quality to it. You should taste it here. What is this, what would a wasabi plant like be similar to? It's just horseradish, kind of. You know? Does it have a bite like the Oh, the for root? sure it absolutely does. Yeah. yeah. But it's very But it's also got like a salty kind of mm. vegetal capery kind of oh, quality yeah. to it as well. Wow. Yeah. So a little of that. And then this right here, which is basically yeast extract and salt. So this is what's gonna make it ultra, ultra savory. And then finally some mayonnaise. Yeah, this is mm. a lot of stuff that I've never cooked with before. <laughs> right. And then last but not least, we need to add a little bit of fresh herbs to this. So we have some fresh dill here and some parsley. So a little bit of both. All right, guys. So this is our taru taru or Japanese tartar sauce, which looks really, really good. So, I mean, that's it. Like we're ready to go at this point. Sweet. So there's one last little like, sort of tidbit that I wanted to share with you guys before we chuck this in the fryer. This isn't filled with just anything. This was a trick I learned like in Scotland and like they do this in a lot of the, you know, fish and chip shops there. Instead of frying in vegetable oil when they fry fish, they fry in beef fat. Oh, I like it. So this thing is loaded with beef fat, which is just Perfect. gonna make this even better. So anytime you're frying, there's, you know, there's no hard and fast rule as far as how much can go in. You kind of just have to eyeball it. I think this basket looks like it can hold, yeah, I'm gonna say five pieces of fish and that's probably it. As far as temp, we're up high. We're up at 375, but in reality, like these household fryers never really can hold that temp. Yeah. So what I do is I bring it up to that, to that, knowing that when I drop this in, we're gonna drop this down to 360, 365, and that's what it's gonna fry at. Okay. And for this, we're going GBD, like nothing else. Golden brown and delicious, baby. Perfect. Yeah, we don't need, there's no GBD. timer, nothing. GBD, that's what we're going that's for here. That's the first time I've ever <laughs> yep. heard that. Like Give it a little it. shake just to make sure that nothing's sticking together. Real oh, yeah. quick. That looks awesome. It's gonna be fast, man. These things are gonna float quick and we're gonna be, we're gonna be good to go there. Look at Ooh, that. Oh man. Those are pretty. Yeah, that's like picture perfect. Yep, just let them drain here for a sec so that we don't end up with any extra grease. Set these bad boys out here on our platter for us. And I might be speaking too soon here, but do you add salt or anything of these after? Nope. Like you're the season before kind of Yeah, thing. and I mean, there's plenty of times to season when it's all said and done, but in this scenario, it won't cling to it. The salt's not gonna stick to that exterior right there, which is why it's really important that we seasoned that fish on the interior, so. What do you think, guys? Man, that looks amazing. Looks pretty tasty to me. Cheers, Cheers, everybody. Yeah. Prost. 
Cheers, yeah, prost. Prost. That's so good. It's terrible, Chester. Yeah. It's awful. It's horrendous. You're not missing right. anything. Yeah. All right. Dude. I'm getting notes of delicious beef fat. Mm -hmm. Crunchy. Yeah. Pickle. I feel like the only thing we could have done to kick this up a notch would have been use Chester's family's pickles. Yeah. That would have made it a little better. Mm. But... Seth, you've eaten a lot of fish. Like, for a fried fish. This is up there. Really? Yeah. If not the top. Is it that sauce that's making it? That like... The sauce. To me, it's the textural contrast. Mm -hmm. Like, it's like, that's why you do it this way. Because it's so crunchy. And yet, like, you can see the fish in here. And it's still, like, super, super juicy. It's, like, just barely cooked. And that's what you want. Yeah. Like I said before, I do a lot of fish frying with cornmeal. And I think the panko just blows it out of the water. Really? Yeah. Oh, good. I'm glad y'all enjoy it, man. You know, my thing with fishing is like, I know I'm not a great fisherman, but what I really like about fishing is this part. It's like the camaraderie. Yep. The fact that you just you spend time together in the boat, you know, shooting the breeze, like enjoying the outdoors, hanging out Telling with each other. Telling fish stories. Telling stories, yep. man. Yep. And on occasion, apparently, playing a little music. So, yeah. Chet, you know any good fishing songs? Nope, not really. You know any yeah. good songs? Yeah, a couple good songs. Play us something, man. Yeah, yeah let's hear it. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>